So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my third panellist, who's Jenny Navin from CPL, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about the opportunities that are available for people who choose STEM careers. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, so I suppose my background is I never studied science. I had the idea that it was all about wearing a lab coat and goggles and cutting up frogs, and I had no interest in that whatsoever until I got to transition year and I got the chance to study a bit of, um, bit of biology and a bit of physics. And I realized that actually everything that I was studying in that year was stuff that I loved all along. It was asking the questions, it was being curious, it was trying to learn about new different things. Um, and I absolutely love computers. Um, my, my granddad would have been a big believer in all the new gadgets that came along. So when he got bored with them, we got them. So I grew up using computers and playing with them before anyone else would have. Um, and that's not going back that long either. But um, I realized then it was all about just being curious and asking questions. But I kind of, I'd already kind of decided what path I wanted to go down at that stage and didn't pursue it academically. But in my life now, it's part of everything that I do. And in part of my job, it's learning every single day about new technology, new sciences, new engineering. Because what I do is I work in recruitment. So I'm talking to scientists and engineers every single day of the week and learning about all of their different jobs and what they do and talking to companies like Intel, like SAP, like Pfizer, like Amgen, um, and learning about the new technologies that they're looking for in their staff that are coming down the line to them. So when they're talking about the new vaccines that they're developing, or the new tablets, the new medicines, the new medical devices, every time they're talking about that, they're talking about the students that they want in five years' time and what they're going to be working on and all of the cutting edge technology. So what they're developing at the moment that nobody that's studying right now knows all about, you guys will be studying in a few years' time and working in that field, hopefully. Um, but one thing that's really kind of obvious is just how much things have changed over the last 15 years. And I think maybe myself and Chris probably should have spoken beforehand about what we were going to talk about because we kind of overlap in our slides because I was just looking at in the last 15 years how much these things have changed. So if you try and Google any of these images, and I say Google by accident now, but you'll see these numbers up here, that's a Google. That's what Google was 15 years ago. It wasn't a search engine. It was a whole string of numbers. If you Google the Amazon, it takes a few pages before you get an image of the actual river before you get to see that, okay? For Googling an apple, it took me three pages of images when I just put in apple into the search engine. It took me three pages of results before I got an image of an actual apple. I'm just getting pictures of iPhones all of the time and iMacs and iPads and everything else. So our language has changed because of the technology that has changed over the last 15 years. And I think that's just quite interesting, um, just as, as an observer of what's going on. In terms of the jobs market, though, you might hear a lot about you know, maybe parents or relatives talking about the recession and the lack of jobs. In the science and technology space, that's definitely not as big a problem as it is in other areas. Definitely some sectors have been hit very badly. But over the last two years, the science and technology sectors have been absolutely booming. Um, I work in a recruitment agency that's been through two different recessions, two very, very big slumps. And we're busier now than we ever have been, despite some areas still being very bad. Science and technology is absolutely booming. Um, there's a lot of investment in Ireland by you know, foreign investors. The likes of um, you know, in the pharmaceutical and biotech sector where I mainly work, you've got the likes of Pfizer just invested 150 million in Ireland this year. Their campus out in Grange Castle in Dublin West is one of their top four manufacturing facilities in the world and they have 140 facilities and Grange Castle is you know, in that top four. And that's because of the staff that they have here and the, the investment that they get from their, from their people in, in the work that they do out there. So there's a huge amount of opportunity in those spaces because of that. Um, with the colleges as well, you heard um, both um, Chris and Arlene talking about the Cran Institute, and you know, that's a spin off. You know, there's a lot of businesses come out of that, um, startup operations from universities. So, when you go to college and you find something that you're really passionate about and you really enjoy, and you have that big spark and say, actually, this could be a business. This isn't just something I need to research for somebody else. Maybe I could make a business out of this. And there's new companies starting up 
every year in these colleges because of that, um, because of people having bright ideas. And I think the Irish are great for starting up businesses and having great ideas and being passionate about following, th following through with it. So that's starting new jobs, new companies, and creating employment as well. Um, if you look at the type of jobs that you can go to, my idea of a scientist when I was you know, 12 and picking my subjects for secondary school were so wrong. Um, if you study science, you can go into so many different areas. Yes, you can work in a lab, you can be testing your chemicals and doing all of that. You could also be working in regulatory affairs where you're talking to the Irish Medicine Board or the FDA about how to regulate the market, how to make sure that everything that you're doing is, is approved, it's tested on, it's tested on animals firstly maybe and then goes on to humans and it's safe and it's secure and it's not going to cause any harm to people. Um, you could be working in artworks, you could be using a, an artistic background to design packaging to make sure that everyone is clear on what they're, what they're buying and what they're purchasing. And if you study engineering, there's a huge huge diverse range of options as well, depending on what field of engineering you want to go down to, whether it's electronics or software, or hardware, or equipment, there's a huge big range of different jobs. So this is just a very small snapshot of what you could be doing. Um, if you look at formulation there, that could be formulations for, for cosmetics, for makeups, for perfumes. We've got great companies in Ireland who are doing that as well, and they all need scientists as well. So there's a big mix of different things. It's definitely not just cutting up frogs in a lab coat like I thought um, in my innocence. And then in terms of the job market now, it's very much so changing from where it would have been, you know, if you were to talk to your parents and relations, and they would have maybe had the idea that you go into a job for life. You finish school, you finish college, you go into a job and you stay there until you retire. Um, that's definitely not the way it is anymore. And again, even when I finished college a few years ago, that's what I thought as well. I thought I was going to go into a job and stay there for, forever more. Um, and I was really surprised when I left college and found out about all of these different jobs or maybe three months or six months or 12 months. And I realized, actually, this is amazing because you can go into a job and work at it for a few, few months or a few years and learn all about that and take your skills from that and move into a different area and try that out as well. And you build up a portfolio of skills. Um, so a bit like you might see in art where you've got your portfolio of drawings and paintings and you'll take that with you when you're trying for, for a new project, you're building on that. You do the same in science and engineering as well. So many of the skills you learn, your critical thinking, your logical skills, your communication skills, your team working skills, all of them make you who you are. It's not just the subject that you studied, it's everything else that comes with it as well. So you really develop a, a portfolio of skills that you can bring with you and it can take you all around the world. There's jobs every country of the world for scientists, for engineers, for people with strong backgrounds in maths and science and engineering. Um, so if you want to travel the world, you can get a career in this and go off to that as well. Um, when it comes to interviews as well now, they're changing as well rapidly. So before you used to go in, you'd sit behind a desk, you'd get asked a load of questions. Now you could end up having to just talk about if you were stuck on a desert island, you know, who would, you, who would get off the desert island? And you're given a whole load of different um, people that are on that island with you and you have to decide who gets off it. And that helps, you, helps the employer decide on who they're going to hire. So it's a completely different way of looking at things because it's looking at your communication skills and your logical thinking. And it's trying to understand much more about who you are, what makes you tick, and what's, what's behind the, the qualifications that you have. And they are extremely important, but it's who you are behind that that really matters as well. And that's why you'll find employers asking you, when you get to that stage of going to an interview, what your hobbies are, what you're interested in, what books you like reading, what magazines you read, what websites you like surfing on. You know, they want to understand what you do in your spare time as well, because all of that helps you when it comes to problem solving. It's not just what you've learned in work, it's your life skills as well. They'll all go into it as well. Um, if we look back again just 10 years ago, I suppose none of these jobs up on screen existed. I think in, in 10 years' time, we'll see a lot more again. It's going to completely change. But if you look at some of these jobs, some of them you, you'll have come across, like bloggers, you know, they get, can get very well paid for what started off as a hobby, maybe. They can now get very well paid for it if they're doing it well. Um, but some of these other jobs as well, I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard of them. So a chief listening officer is one that I think is, is particularly interesting. Um, and that's somebody who will be on the internet day in, day out, working for a company to see what people are saying about them. So if you think about when you've gone into a shop and you've had a bad experience and you put it up on Twitter, 
how quickly sometimes the company will come back to you and say, well, we're really sorry to hear you about, had a bad experience. Tell us more about it. We want to fix it. The person who's watching all of that social media, you know, they could be a chief listening officer. So they're looking at blogs, at Twitter, at Facebook, trying to see what people are saying about their company. And sometimes it'll be in a way that it's, it's just trying to minimize problems with the company. Other times it's that they're hearing about ideas. It's a new way of, you know, you might have a great idea that this company would be amazing if they did X, Y, and Z. And the chief listening officer is picking up on that and maybe they're developing the company based on your suggestions on, on Twitter or your rant on Twitter about the company. So there's a lot of different things that you can look at here. And then if we look to the future, in 2015 to 2025, these are some of the, some of the jobs that we think will exist based on the research that, that's been done out in the market. Um, so if you look at like a body part maker, so you're looking at a biomedical scientist growing, organically growing body parts for transplants. So it doesn't need to be that you just have a transplant surgery. You've got pieces of, you know, of cells and DNA being grown into, into body parts to, to be transplanted. So you don't need a donor for it. It, it can be grown. Um, if you look at a vertical farmer, we're, you know, in some of the most populated areas running out of space. Um, there's, no, there's nowhere to grow to, to expand. So you have to go upwards. So you can see that this is just a, a small image of it, but this could be what our farms look like in the future, that they're, you know, they're multi-stories and that's, that's the way it's going to be. Um, another one that one of my colleagues who, who did this talk during the week was talking about was a meteor detector. Um, and it was scientists who look at all of those meteors that we hear about randomly in the news. Um, you probably heard the story of the one that crashed into Russia there a few years ago, or not even a few months ago, really, two years ago, was it? Yeah. Um, and the power that came from that, and it really wasn't expected to hit. Um, they, they were kind of caught a bit unaware, so they, they were, you know, need to be monitoring those a bit more closely. As the, the world becomes more densely populated, we need to know where these things are going to strike um, and to be aware of it. So there's a lot of different jobs turning, turning up and everything is really changing because of us. Um, and I suppose one thing then for, for everyone here to be aware of is it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. And I think that is very, very true these days. What, what existed five years ago, you know, is going to have completely changed in five years' time again. So we need to be able to, to wrap that up as well. All right. So thank you very much for listening today. OK, guys. So this is the most important part of this roadshow. It's when we open the floor to you guys, where you have an opportunity to ask any one of us. So you have a scientist, you have a technologist, you have an engineer, and you have a recruiter in the science and engineering sector. So if you have any questions around that, we will be delighted to hear them. Okay, great. Um, I have two questions as well. Um, the first one is kind of a general question for everyone. Um, what aspect of your career would you say is the most challenging or most interesting? That's the first one. I think it's interesting. I would say the diversity of it. No two days are ever the same. I'd actually agree with you as yeah. well. It's, it's the diversity. For yeah. me, I'm talking to scientists and engineers every day, so learning every day about new types of technology, new approaches to work, new, new different jobs. So it's, it's, it's learning and it's, it's the curiosity, I suppose, in us all um, that you get to, to satisfy, I think, in, in jobs in STEM areas. Um, I was wondering, are there any careers in science, technology or engineering for people who aren't particularly good or interested in maths? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Panelists, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's plenty of skills that wouldn't involve um, necessarily having math skills, I suppose. There's plenty of jobs. If you're to look at more of the quality assurance area, which is more paperwork and documentation, um, it's probably a bit more office-based, and you're, you're working with teams who are, who are doing the more, the more mathematical side of the work, and you're doing all of the, the paperwork side, which, you know, for some people, they absolutely love because they're, they're talking to lots of different people, they're learning about lots of different problems, but they don't necessarily have to approach it from a, from a mathematical side. Oh, what are the most popular careers that people who study physics go into? And it's, it's so interesting. I was actually at a talk a few weeks ago with a pharmaceutical company, and they were saying they've partnered with McLaren Formula One racing team because Formula One racing teams have, they use telemetry to, to observe what's going on on the, on the race cars. So they can, they can look at the temperatures and you know, what the tires were doing and all of that different stuff. And the pharmaceutical companies now are trying to partner and kind of employ that technology 
in hospitals to look at how the how the medicines are reacting in people and how their medical devices maybe are reacting and they're using what the Formula One teams are doing now for medical reasons and I just think that's really interesting and that would be a huge amount of you know from the IT side from the physics side so many different elements kind of going into that as well um, and I think that's absolutely fascinating and like that the volumes of data that they get from that and trying to to make any sense of it um, but it's it's a big area at the moment and it's getting even bigger. Thank you. Great. What's the best advice you can give us for each one of your jobs? Um, it really is about doing something that you love, something that you're always always learning when you're doing it. Um, if every day is is challenging you and you leave going home in the evening and say, I've done something today, I've achieved something, I've learned something today, you'll love your job forever. You'll never dread going in on a Monday morning. You know, if you know you're going to leave in the evening, I'm happy that you've, you've achieved something, whether that's an experiment that's gone wrong, but you've learned from it, or something that's gone right, you've made a breakthrough. Um, it, it's really, it's just enjoying what you do. And you, sometimes you'll have to try a few different ones to find that, but it's finding something that you absolutely love doing.